Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're doing another sentiment prediction um, from tweets about coronavirus. So we can't actually see the uh, file here, but you'll see that it comes in a train and test set CSV. So um, we have four columns, and let's just get into it. So given tweets about the COVID-19 pandemic, let's try to predict the sentiment of a given tweet. And we will use a TensorFlow recurrent neural network to make our predictions. So um, I'm importing some standard libraries here. We got NumPy and Pandas, of course, uh, Plotly for visualization. And then for pre-processing, we're going to use regular expressions. Uh, from the natural language toolkit, we're getting stop words. And then from Keras pre-processing, we're getting tokenizer and pad sequences. And from sklearn, we're getting the train test split function. You know, actually, I realize we probably won't need this one today. Okay, and TensorFlow is what we're using to build our model. So I'll go ahead and run that. And I'm just going to get both these files over here. Let's call it trainDF and testDF. And uh, both of them I can load in using the pandas.readcsv function. And we can grab the file path for each one. Whoops. So train's going in there, test is going in there. All right, let's load it in and take a look. Ah, wait, we got it. We got an error. Sometimes we get this error. All we have to do is specify the encoding at the end, Latin one. I'll just put that on this one as well. All right, so we'll take a look. And we'll load both of them up just to see they're the same. And yes, they have all the same columns. Uh, it comes with the location, a um, date that the tweet was sent, and um, the tweet text, along with the sentiment. And you can see it's not just uh, negative, neutral, positive. It's extremely negative, um, negative, neutral, positive, extremely positive. So, uh, why don't we get started pre-processing? Although, we should probably just get some information first. So traindf.info and testdf.info. Just a brief overview. Uh, we can see we have some missing values in the location column, but we're probably not going to be using it. Probably not going to use the location pro uh, column. We're just going to use the tweet today. Okay, so let's start pre-processing. And I'm going to construct... Uh, okay, um, what I'm going to do is get um, train inputs. It's going to be train df sub original tweet, which is the original tweet column, dot copy. And test inputs is going to be the same thing, except on the test df. So I'm just making a basically a panda series that's just a copy of this column. And so I'm doing the splitting first here. Because our inputs are, this is the whole input, we're not using multiple columns in our input, I'm just going to split uh, before we pre-process. And then I can get the labels from here. So train labels. It's going to be uh, train df sub sentiment dot copy and test labels if you can guess is just test df sub copy uh, dot copy sorry all right so let's load that up if we take a look at one of them our train inputs looks like this our train labels looks like this. So just two different uh, columns from the original data frame. And we don't have to worry about missing values because we can see uh, both of these columns, uh, we have no missing values in either one. So what do we do next? Okay, I'm gonna uh, label the sentiment. So there's actually a really cool way to do this. Um, train labels, looks like this, right? So I want to convert them into numbers. 
Now what I'm going to do um, is actually uh, group them. I'm not going to have five classes, extremely negative, negative, neutral, positive, extremely positive. I'm going to simplify it, make it three classes. So what we can do is call uh, sentiment labels uh, or sentiment, sentiment encoding is going to just be, uh, actually it's going to be a dictionary. It's going to map a value in here, so extremely negative. It's going to be mapped to zero. Then negative is also going to be mapped to zero because I want them to be treated as the same thing. Then neutral will be mapped to one. Positive will be mapped to two. And extremely positive will also be mapped to two. So I want them also to be treated as the same thing. And then what we can do with this is actually just say uh, train labels dot replace sentiment encoding. So we can actually just pass in the dictionary into the replace function that will replace any instances of a key with the corresponding value. And so that's going to be our new train labels. And we'll do the same for test. And let's run that. Actually, let me just indent these so it's nicer. Okay. So I run that. If we look at train labels now, see it's now one, two, uh, zeros, ones, and twos. All right, fantastic. So uh, let's look at the tweets. So train inputs. Now, um, I was originally going to um, split this into a list of words and use each word as, uh, as an input to our model. But after looking at uh, some other notebooks, I actually found um, from Shahrais had a notebook, COVID-19 tweets with 85% accuracy. And he did an amazing job at um, finding a cleaner function that does uh, really well. So what he actually does is he does not process them word, process the sequence word by word. He does it character by character. And so it's interesting. I wouldn't think to do that, but it makes sense. And that's, yeah, it's probably more common than I think. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just take his function. Because uh, honestly, I tried for like uh, two hours to make his uh, model and his, his pre-processing function better, and I could not do it. It seems like it's a very solid approach. So uh, let's just, I'm just going to copy and paste his function in here. So um, I'm getting this stop words. And stop words is, it comes from the natural language toolkit. And essentially what it does is it, it's a list of words in a specified language, in this case English, that are um, not useful, essentially. They're not so useful to the, to the model. So I don't know, can we actually see what it looks like? Yeah, we can. So all these words are not useful. Right, so... It's interesting. They're sort of like found all over the place and they don't contribute much to the meaning of the uh, tweet. Uh, for some reason, this really improves the performance. Uh, so we're going to, at the end, here, let me just step step through it one by one. First, we'll remove URLs. So we're using regular expressions to find any time we see a URL and remo replace it with a space. Then we'll remove HTML tags. So any sort of HTML tag we find, we'll replace with a space as well. Um, then we'll find any digits and replace digits with the space, replace hashtags with the space, and replace mentions with a the space. Then we will split it into a list of words. Then we will join it back together, but only using the words that are not in stop words. So 
at the end, we'll have a string, because we're joining it, um, but it's a string of a string with all the stop words taken out. And so I'm going to run that. And let me just include something here. Function uh, taken from, let me just copy, paste. Wonderful notebook. All right. And we're going to apply this function to our uh, inputs. So train inputs, remember it looks like this. If I apply process tweet, uh, it shouldn't take too long. There's nothing in here that's too bad. Yeah, you can see uh, it's been sort of like simplified, but not like really, not too much. So all any sort of special characters are kept in there because now we're going to be processing the sequence character by character. Uh, but all the numbers have been removed, as you can see. Um, any mentions have been removed and any uh, hashtags as well, along with URLs and HTML tags. But it's interesting, we can see uh, ready to go has become ready go because two is a, is a stop word. So we're not going to include it in. All right, and now with this, uh, we're going to do the same thing to test inputs. And that's going to be the same. Uh, I mean, that's what we're going to set them equal to. So, uh, yeah, I'll leave that there. We'll take a, we'll run that, and then we'll take a look at it. Okay. So, uh, we're going to use. We need the max sequence length. So as I did in my last video, um, I'm going to get it by finding the max, the numpy.max, of all the train labels, sorry, not uh, train inputs, with this spe uh, simple lambda function applied. It's going to take a tweet and return the length of the tweet. So what this looks like is just all the tweets. What this looks like is a series of all the lengths of the tweets. And then this is the maximum of those. So this is going to be max sequence length. All right. We don't have to look at it right away because I'm going to also um, create a tokenizer first. So a tokenizer is going to, so this is from Keras, right? It's going to find every single character in this situation. Before we were doing it on words, but now it's going to do every unique character. And it's going to get, assign each unique character a number, an integer, a unique integer. And uh, it's going to do it in order of most frequent character to least frequent character. So we'll use the tokenizer dot fit on text and we're going to pass in uh, train inputs. So we're going to fit the tokenizer on the inputs. Then we're going to get a vocab length, uh, which we can actually get just from the, uh, well, let me run this first so I, I can show you. We'll fit it on the train inputs. And then tokenizer after it's been fit has uh, something called word index, which is just a dictionary of all the words and what they've been mapped to. Uh, this is the most common word, second most common word, third most common word, and so on. So, um, right, so what we're going to do is note that the length of the tokenizer uh, word index plus one is actually the total number of our, uh, is the length of our vocabulary. And the plus one is, I believe, for a uh, it's like a um, end of sequence character or out of sequence character, um, <clears throat> but I'm not entirely sure actually why we need the plus one. It was giving me an error uh, when we didn't have it. If any of you know why we use plus one, please let me know. 
So we'll grab that and we will make that the vocab length. This is the length of the tokenizer word index plus one. And we're going to use this uh, when we create our model. Uh, we're actually, okay, yeah. So now train inputs is going to be um, tokenizer.texts two sequences. train inputs. So uh, we're going to convert the train inputs into sequences of numbers and then store it back in train inputs when we're done. And I'm going to do the same thing for test inputs. And notice that I'm only fitting it on the train inputs, but I'm going to uh, convert both the train and test uh, from the same fit. So this is test and we'll look at that. And if we look at what this looks like now, you'll see it's actually um, a list of lists of uh, sequences. So this is one tweet, what I've highlighted here. Uh, this is another tweet. Each unique character has been converted into a, uh, into a integer. Interesting. You know, it looks like maybe that's actually words. Maybe it automatically detects spaces. I mean, here's train inputs. We have example 0, example 1, example 2. And example 2 has way more characters than this. Hmm. It's interesting. I'm not really sure about this. This may be actually just encoding words. Uh, instead of characters. In any case, uh, this mo this approach works really well. Um, so we're going to continue with it. <coughs> I'm going to print out. Let me just copy and paste it for simplicity. Printing out the vocab length and the max sequence length now. So we have thirty six thousand one hundred seventeen unique words, <coughs> and the longest sequence is two hundred eighty six. Now this, I'm almost positive, is not of words. It's interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not actually sure, although I should be. Um, I will get back to you on this. Probably reference this in a future video after I understand this better. Um, but in any case, we have a length of our vocab and the length of the maximum sequence. So what we do next is we're going to pad the sequences. Um, so we have the inputs is going to be pad sequences. This function we imported from keras.preprocessing.sequence. And we're padding train inputs. And we're setting the maximum length to max sequence length. So what this will do is add um, zeros. Uh, if I specify post, it'll add them to the end. It's going to add zeros until we get to maximum sequence length. So if we have a particularly short tweet, we will make it as long as we need to. And this doesn't apply here, but if we had a longer tweet than max sequence length, it would be truncated down to max sequence length. So this will give our inputs, uh, and this will make our inputs all of the same length, which we can then feed into our model. So I'll make this test. And I'm just going to run these two lines, click up here. And uh, yeah, let's start modeling. So let's take a look at our input shapes. So train inputs dot shape. So we have 41,157 examples. And uh, each example is a sequence of length 286. Now I'm going to start with a an inputs uh, input layer. And the shape is max sequence length, uh, a vector of length max sequence length. So we're we're feeding in a sequence one at a time. Well, in batches really. Uh, and we'll start off with an embedding layer, <clears throat> and this will perform a dense encoding of each word by sending it to 
a location in high dimensional vector space given by uh, the dimension given by embedding dimension, which I will write up here. So the dimension that worked best for this model is 16. Uh, and I assume that's because there's not too many uh, like intricate uh, meaning dependencies among words found in tweets. As it's usually more of a simple dialogue or a simple um, language that's used. So, it, like for example, when I was doing, uh, when I was running a chess moves, it was a list of chess moves through uh, an RNN, I had to use a very high embedding dimension because the, the uh, relationships between the moves were really intricate and deep. In this case, though, a 16 seems to work the best. Um, and we're going to set up our tf.keras.layers.embedding layer. And why don't I just give these all names? So name equals input, input layer. And embedding is uh, going to take three arguments. Input dimension. output dimension, and input length. So input dimension is the size of our vocabulary. So all the possible words that can get fed in here. Uh, so it's going to map words in, uh, you could think of it as one-hot encoded vectors, right? Uh, each word would in, in a one-hot encoding scheme would be, or a sparse encoding, would be mapped into a uh, 36,117 dimensional space where it would be all zeros and there'd be a single one and it's going to convert it to an output dimension so this will be vocab length and it's going to convert it's going to send it to an output dimension that is embedding dimension so it's going to send a 30, 36,000 element vector to a 16 element vector which is much nicer for our model and the, the cool thing about the embedding layer is it's actually going to learn where to send it at uh, during training. So it's, it's learning the best way to group uh, these words. The input length is just going to be max sequence length. This, uh, that's what we're feeding in. All right, and then we'll pass in inputs. Let me actually just give this a name as well. So the name will be uh, tweet or we'll say word embedding. Okay. And now uh, this is this is adapted from the model uh, from this notebook that I showed you. Um, he actually used a an LSTM, and I found GRU is working better for me. GRU tends to work better for small tasks. Um, but aside from that, all his um, all his uh, hyperparameters and model architecture work extremely well. So I'm just going to take take them. Uh, I have no shame. <laughs> so uh, our GRU layer is going to be a bidirectional GRU. So this is going to feed the sequence into the GRU forward and backwards. So we'll have twice as many uh, hidden units here. Uh, tf.keras.layers.bidirectional and the bidirectional layer takes in another layer as input. Uh, so we're going to give it a, a GRU. So tf.keras.layers.gru uh, We had uh, in his notebook he used 256 units which works well and we enable return sequences. So this will actually return uh, sequences rather than just the final hidden state from the GRU layer. Uh, so it is true. And the, the thing is this won't be a uh, one-dimensional if we have return sequences on. So we have to make sure to follow it up with uh, max pooling after that so that we can get it back down into one-dimensional. tf.keras.layers.max pool uh, global max pool 1D. All right, so let me give this a name. Uh, first, let me feed in embedding. And we'll give this a name. 
uh, RNN. How about RNN layer? And then uh, max pooling. Give that a name as well. Uh, max pooling is fine. And we'll send in GRE layer. All right. And now uh, this is what's unique about this particular architecture that he used. He has a, a dropout a, followed by a dense and then another dropout and then the final output. So we're going to do that. Uh, dropout one is tf.keras.layers.dropout. Use 40% dropout here. Uh, we'll give it a name as well. And we'll send in max pooling. And I'll just copy this, paste it down here, call this one dropout two. And then in, in between them, we're going to have a dense. So dense equals tf.keras.layers.dense with 64 activations, ReLU activation, and we'll name it dense. Send in dropout one here. And then here we'll send in dense. Then finally, our output layer is going to be uh, a dense layer with three activations, one for each of our classes. And uh, we'll give it a softmax activation function. Here we'll pass in dropout two. Okay, now we'll set up our model tf.keras.layers. Uh, uh, no, not layers, model inputs equals inputs, outputs equals outputs. And then let's uh, let's plot it uh, with the print model dot summary and then uh, tf.keras dot utils dot plot model. Max sequence length is not defined. What? Oh, I, I didn't finish it. Length and length. Okay. Uh, oh, we used dense twice. Oh, we didn't give this a name. Name output layer. And we also have. A, oh, we didn't feed model into here. All right. Okay. So here's our um, summary. You can see we start off with uh, a sequence of 200, length 286. That gets embedded into uh, 16 dimensions. The 16 dimensions, uh, well, it's actually 286 by 16. So uh, each word gets embedded as 16 dimensions. Um, and then we uh, send each one of those. So each word goes through the RNN. Uh, and we return sequences here. Uh, we're returning all 286 sequences, and then we pull it down to just a single um, max. Well, we, we max pull it, so we get a single vector of length 512. Then we drop out some, and we feed it through a dense layer of length 60 of 64 units. Then we drop some of those out, and then we feed it into our final output. And you can see here, um, I didn't name the GRU. Let me do that. <laughs> Why don't I do that just to make it nice? bidirectional layer and then here name is GRU layer okay so yeah so we have a bidirectional layer with a GRU layer inside first we, we feed it in goes to word embedding goes to the GRU goes to max pooling then drop out one dense drop out two and output layer all right and then uh, we can start training So we're going to compile it. Atom optimizer. Sparse categorical cross entropy loss. And um, just accuracy for metrics. And for our batch size, uh, we'll do 32. And it's good to, this actually starts overfitting after two epochs, so I'm just doing two. 
and restore models fit history in history training on train inputs and train labels let's give it a validation split I'm just going to use the same split that he had in this notebook 12% uh, and then we'll pass in the batch size and epochs and then verbose uh, 2 okay so let's train that and while that trains I'm just going to plot the results with plotly plotly express so create a new figure px.line drawing a values from history.history .history. and the values we want are the loss and validation loss let's give it some labels alright we'll show it it's not much to show here uh, actually hasn't finished training um, shouldn't be too long. Uh, GRUs tend to take a bit of time to train. Um, I have GPU acceleration on, but I'll just pause the video and come back when it's done. All right, uh, it finished, and you can see the uh, the plot is only showing two epochs. So uh, it looks like validation loss uh, went down slightly, actually, uh, but the training loss went down substantially, as to be expected. Uh, and we end up with a pretty high accuracy value here. So I'll just evaluate it and then we'll be done. And I'll evaluate on the test inputs and test labels. And we end up with an accuracy of 85%. So it's pretty good. Um, I couldn't find any notebooks that did better, but if you, if you do, let me know. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content, and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.